Mushoku Tensei Redundancy Chapter 25 My name is Nanahoshi. Nanahoshi Shizuka. Due to some circumstances, I am currently running in the garden of Perugia's castle, Chaos Breaker. The cobblestone path circling the castle is definitely not easy to run on. Even so, I will keep running. That is because I need some exercise. Recently, I have been running like this every single day. The castle is surrounded by this beautiful garden and its appearance changes every time I wake up. Different flowers bloom every month, resulting in a rotating assortment of colors. If I were to wake up every day instead of once every month, I would be able to fully appreciate this gradual change. Foo. Three laps around the castle. That takes up just about an hour. Of course, it's not like I was continuously running for an hour, I don't have the stamina for that. If I have to take small breaks, I will. Initially, I was plagued with muscle cramps due to my sedentary lifestyle, but lately, this level of activity rarely results in cramps or sores. This must be a result of my body becoming more physically fit through training. If I can train to become fit, then it logically follows that a lack of activity will make me fat. Anyways, if I am running with this frequency, I shouldn't be able to get too fat. Not that I am against getting fat. It's just that I don't want to be mistaken as someone else when I return home. After catching my breath, I took a shower, changed clothes and returned to my room. I wonder what's on the menu today. What will Rudeus bring me today? I pushed the door open while having those thoughts in mind. Hmm. What's wrong? Your chances of winning are slim now. Surrender. However, rude use is nowhere to be found. In his place are Zenoba and Perugius. Between them sits a table on which they are playing a game similar to chess. The chess pieces are well crafted, such that minute details can be made out even at a distance. This set was probably taken from Perugia's collection, or bought somewhere by Zenoba. As for the state of the game, it seems like Zenoba is being outnumbered. Even without looking at the board, you can tell that Perugius is winning by looking at Silveril moving her wings with pride. Come to think of it, this world also has a game like that. How nostalgic! Back in middle school, I was really into games like chess and shogi. I used to go to a dojo-like place in the neighborhood to play from time to time. In fact, I won quite a lot of those games. I stopped all of that once I got into high school, though. Please wait a moment. In the Sharon Kingdom, we fight to the last man without surrender. You do not have the makings of a ruler it seems. Even if you lose the war, you can rebuild the country as long as troops remain. You mean there existed a country rebuilt with just surviving troops and a dead leader? How ignorant, Zainoba Sharon. It is the very country you were born in. Your country descends from one that was annihilated in the war with Laplace. I see it is no wonder that the downfall of my country occurred in my generation. Leaving aside the contents of the conversation, I am more interested in what they were eating while playing their game of chess. Two slices of white bread cut in either squares or triangles, with something in between. From what I see, that something consists of green and yellow stuff. Regardless of what is put in between the two slices of bread, the name of the dish remains the same. It's sandwiches. Long time no see, Zainoba. Oh, Nana Hoshidono. Good morning. It has really been a while. Zainoba has really gotten old as compared to the Zainoba I remember. Much of his hair has become white and his face is filled with wrinkles. He is now over forty years old, from what I have heard. Zainoba is officially an old man now. So it's not rude use today, huh? Shisho one has been busy recently, you see. Remember that incident? Ah. Some time ago. Rudeus consulted with me on a dreadfully serious topic. It was regarding the elopement of Ars and Aisha. As for what happened during his consultation, it's so heavy for someone like me that I did not know what to say at all. All I could do was to give vague responses or keep quiet. He brought in donuts on that day, but I could not appreciate the taste at all. In the end, more than half of the donuts remained unconsumed. 
it seems that the issue is still unresolved. Even so, as you can see, Shisho has prepared food for everyone here. You should eat up too, Nanahoshi Dono. Itodakimos. I sat beside Zainoba. Although only a third of the sandwiches remain, there are still a variety of fillings to choose from. There's one filled with tomagoyaki too, some with what looks like smoked meat and grilled fish, as well as those with white filling, probably potato salad. For now, I reached out and grabbed the tomagoyaki sandwich. It may have caught my interest because of its bright yellow and green colors, but it was also due to nostalgia. As my family did not make onigiri, my lunchboxes were often packed with sandwiches. Among them, there were always tomagoyaki sandwiches. Thick cuts of tomagoyaki and a lettuce-like vegetable are held between the bread slices. I held it with my bare hands and started nibbling the top part of the triangle. The inner side of the fluffy bread has gotten soft from the moisture. Biting into the lettuce-like layer, I feel a slight crunch as a subtle bitterness spreads in my mouth. As my teeth sink into the softly fried tomagoyaki layer, saltiness hits me with a slight hint of sweetness, balancing the bitter taste of the lettuce. A salty aftertaste is left in my mouth, intensifying my urge to take the next bite. Just when I was about to take a second bite, the tomagoyaki slipped out of the bread and landed on my plate, possibly because it was too thick. I picked the tomagoyaki up with my fingers, returned it in between the bread and took my second bite. This may be bad table manners, but I don't care. While wiping my fingers with a handkerchief, I took my third and fourth bite. Bread, lettuce and eggs. Even with just three ingredients, this wonderful balance of flavor is achieved. There's also me being hungry from the physical activity, as I instantly finished eating the first sandwich. Still, it is quite unbelievable what happened. Even wise people would act so rashly. How unbelievable is that? That is human nature at work. With a snort, Perugius moved his chess piece. Zainoba reacted with a uck to Perugius move, and reached out for a sandwich while staring at the chessboard. What do you mean by that? Humans are the most foolish when they desire something. They fail to do something they are usually able to do, and they take the easiest and most irrational route. Don't you remember such times, yourself? Yes, I do. As expected. This chessboard is the perfect demonstration of that. You left yourself defenseless, trying to take my king. You throw away your troops needlessly over and over again with those reckless attacks, all the while not realizing that the king was just a bait. Perugius has an overwhelming advantage in the chess game. Zenoba lost more than half of his army and is being surrounded by Perugius troops. Subsequently, after experiencing your defeat in this match, you would probably stop taking baits that are dangling right in front of you. Even if you were tempted by your desire, you would be able to control it. However, after a few matches, you would fall for the same trap again and choose the simplest way to attack. That is human nature, and humans are foolish. So you are saying that no matter how smart one is, he will repeat the same foolish actions. I don't know about that. But for someone that always makes the optimal decision after considering the cost and benefits, which route she chooses when desire takes over. Wouldn't that be a sight to behold? I see, is that why Perugia's summer would not tell Shisho about Aisha's whereabouts? If that is the case, pardon me as I would have no choice but to say that you have bad taste. Humph, I have no intentions of moving my subordinates for such a trivial matter. It seems like Rudeus had sought help from Perugius. If only Perugius had swiftly found Aisha, I would not have felt so needlessly depressed. Though you say that, doesn't Perugius' summer also have desires? How? Your obsession with Laplace, isn't that in Perugius' summer's own words, utter foolishness? Zenoba, are you trying to say that I am a fool? My apologies, that is not my intention. Fine. You are right, I am foolish by nature. But Zenoba, a person can make wise decisions with full knowledge that they are foolish. Having an increasingly strong urge to let out a heavy sigh, I reached out for my next sandwich. Being wise or foolish what a drag. 
If I think too much about what Perugius is talking about, I would definitely not be able to savour my sandwich. And even fools come in many varieties, for example. Hey, how long are you guys gonna go on about that topic? When they heard that, both of them exchanged glances. Zenoba adjusted his glasses while Perugius snorted in displeasure. My apologies, this isn't something we talk about over good food. Perugius summer, let's leave it at that. Humph. The conversation ended and both of them returned to playing their game in silence. I should also go back to having my meal. Next, the ham sandwich. It had a rectangular shape, made to fit the shape of the ham. This is probably the grey rat household's homemade ham. When I hold it in my hand, it can feel that the ham is covered in spices. What was this called again? Yes, it's pastrami. The ham itself is cut thickly, giving it a juicy appearance. Lifting up the bread a little, I can see that the inner sides of the bread and the lettuce are slathered in a brown-coloured sauce. It looks incredibly delicious. Without a second of delay, I opened my mouth wide and bit into it. The bread felt a little harder compared to the previous ones. I feel the body of the ham and the crunchiness of the cucumber and lettuce, hitting my teeth with a nice resistance. If I were to describe the tomagoyaki sandwich as an experience of softness upon softness, then this sandwich would be an experience of denseness upon denseness. On top of that, the sauce accentuates the meaty taste of the ham, stimulating my taste buds. The spicy taste in my mouth gets stronger with every bite. Looks like the spice used on the meat came from the Migad village in the magic continent. Just as I was thinking that aloud, Silveril came serving tea. Her displeased expression might be because this spice came from the magic continent and was produced by the hands of a magic race. Perugia's subordinates do not take a liking to people from the magic race. Maybe her displeased expression was because of what Zenoba said as a rebuttal to Perugius or even due to me ending their conversation prematurely. Is this okay? Even if it's made by the magic race, an ingredient is still an ingredient, they are not the magic race itself. Was what the generous Perugia Summer said. Through Rudeus Summer, we hold some of this spice in the castle's kitchen. Ultimately, Perugius prioritized his own desires and took the easier way out. This spice was purchased from the Migad village by Rudeus. In the end, his money is going right into the pockets of the magic race. Anyways, I couldn't care any less about that. I took a sip of the red tea and gave a sigh of relief. Let's see, which one should I eat now? The potato salad sandwich looks nice. Check. Surrender now, Zenoba. Hmm, looks like I have nowhere to escape. I surrender. If you had said that twenty moves earlier, your troops would not have died in vain. While talking, Zenoba added salt to his vegetable sandwich and ate it. So you can eat it that way too. When I saw that, I started to crave the sandwich with the tomato-like vegetable filling. As expected of Perugia summer, you are too strong. I cannot imagine myself winning. That goes without saying. I have been playing this game for several hundreds of years. As if I would lose to humans who cannot even live past a hundred years. No, let's go with the other sandwich. The Menkai Katsu 3 sandwich, which is the only other option left. Right, Katsu sandwich it is. While I am still hungry, I want to eat something with more of a bite to it. Nanahoshi, how about it? One match? No thank you, I'm good. I see. Not only did you cut our conversation off, you would also refuse to have a match with us. No, that's our. Just when I was about to reach out for the katsu sandwich, Perugius took it and bit into it. That was the last one. If you looked at the sandwiches on the plate, four flavors of sandwiches were lined up together. In other words, there should have been four katsu sandwiches. They were placed closest to Perugius. There were four people in the room. Theoretically, if each person were to eat one type of sandwich each, I should have my share of that katsu sandwich Silveril wasn't even eating this time round. So Zenoba, shall we have a rematch? Or Silveril? You sometimes lose on purpose so I can't really trust you. 
I will do it. Please teach me the rules and how to move the pieces. Hearing me say that, Perugius broke into a wide grin. Seeing that expression, I finally understood. He probably ate my katsu sandwich predicting that I would do this. I pushed Zenoba aside and sat in front of the board, in full knowledge that I thoroughly fell for his ploy, four wins and eleven losses. That's my score for today. More losses than wins. At first I lost three games in a row, which allowed me to learn the rules and features of this game. As it seems like classic shogi tactics are often being employed, I used the double check and open check techniques like it was the most natural thing to do. After the fourth match, I learned the trick to smoothly build an encirclement of the enemy. Winning became much easier, but I haven't fully grasped how to attack properly, resulting in a fragmented offense. It ended up with me trying to fend off various offensive moves from Perugius. While doing that, I attacked with shogi tactics similar to the climbing silver and the fourth file rook. Having these attacks in my arsenal, my scores with Perugius were about 50 to 50, with me winning the final match. The moment Perugius lost the last match, his face was filled with frustration, despite having more wins than losses. Losing four times to a beginner player like me must have damaged his pride as a perfectionist. Being able to see his twisted facial expression, I will leave aside my resentment of not being able to eat the katsu sandwich. As the game was ending, I finished up the remainder of the sandwiches. I had my fill today. Satisfaction. It is too bad that I couldn't eat the katsu sandwich. I'll request it again next time. My apologies Nanahoshi Dono, it seems like I have done you a disservice today. As he was about to leave, Zainoba said that with an apologetic expression. I wonder what he is apologizing for. We didn't really talk today, right? Ah, he was observing at the side the whole time I was playing the game with Perugius, occasionally giving me advice. We did talk. If it's not about not talking to me, then it must be regarding that topic. I should be the one apologizing. I may have appeared a little irritable today, I shouldn't have stopped their debate. If you have any message you want to leave to Shisho or anyone else, should I pass them on for you? Let's see, to Rudeus, I pray that his issue is resolved soon. Can you tell him that for me? Understood. Well then, I will return again, next time with Shisho and Cliff Dono. Exchanging those words, I saw Zainoba off. It was good that Zainoba came for me today. There was a day when neither Rudeus nor Zainoba, not even Perugius came to visit me. I spent that day quietly in a daze, alone in my room. My mind wandered off and was filled with negative thoughts, making me needlessly depressed. Compared to that, I would much rather be having conversations, even with the kinds of topics discussed today. Lately, I think I have come to better appreciate the value of having liveliness and company. It's not like I absolutely need company, but with no one around, it feels lonely. All right, please come again. I replied to Zainoba, feeling thankful for his words. However, while having a meal, I would prefer to talk about brighter topics. With such thoughts, my eyelids grew heavier as I fell asleep. Mushoku Tensei Redundancy Chapter 25 Extra Aisha and Ars disappeared. The household fell into a state of panic. As soon as I read their note, I sprinted out of the house. I have no clue where they might hide, but I got to look for them. I begin with places they, particularly Aisha, would frequent in the city. But they couldn't be found. Not even after a full day of search. Rude Mercenary Company. Cliff's House. Magic University. Mercenary cause various warehouses around the city. Aisha's favorite cafe, clothing and fabric stores, grocers, and wholesalers. I even went by Ersted's office to look. No sight of them anywhere. Looks like they're no longer in the city. It wasn't like there were no eyewitnesses. Early in the morning, they walked past the city gates. Early in the morning, they left in a horse carriage. Early in the morning, they borrowed horses from the stable and left. And other intel like these. But every intel conflicts with another. So I don't even know whether they're still inside the city or out. 
I'm afraid this has all been part of Aisha's misinformation campaign. But Aisha could not have spread all this misinformation alone. Who could have helped? Who could Aisha command at will? The answer is obvious. The mercenary corporation. As soon as I reached the conclusion, I headed back to rude mercenary company HQ. Rinia and Persona need to be properly interrogated. Rude mercenary company, rule number one. Proper greeting etiquette. Bow hard, head low. Rude mercenary company, rule number two. Back straight, yell loud. Rude mercenary company, rule number three. Never forget, treat patrons with courtesy. On my return, Rinya and Persona are side by side, standing imposingly, giving instruction to the core members on the company creeds. Never forget Naya. Internalize them Nano. They alternated the instructions as a tag team. Like some kind of underground society. I guess I should taught them this. Rinya, Persona, come here for a bit. Naya? The boss is back. Speaking of which, the financial advisor hasn't Naya. I was just going to ask about that. All right, you're all dismissed. Work hard today. After the company members scattered, I followed them to the office. A nice, steady set of table and chairs, seem awfully expensive. A statue of an unknown creature. It looked like a fierce monster. A magic tool Aya gave them to keep meat fresh, a fridge. A room decorated with Rinia, Persona, and Aisha's favorite things. Aisha likes cute stuff. Even though she lacks the talent to make them, she has a good eye for them. Don't know why I would suddenly recall something like that, but as soon as they sat down I began the interrogation. So you two haven't heard nothing? W we don't know anything Naya. That's right. We got nothing, not even any meat nano. Rinia whistled crudely, and Persona's voice dropped at the first mention of meat. Looks like they do have some idea. Sounds like you actually know something. Now fess up. I was sad with the grimmest face I could muster. Instantly terrified, hugging each other, they nod heavily. We don't know exactly where they went, Naya. Really don't Nano. Just that first thing in the morning, she told us to spread rumors around Naya. We are not lying, please believe us. Even though we don't have any proof Nano. No proof, huh? In other words, no way to figure out which intel is true, and which is false. At least, not without Aisha's skills in shifting through intel. At least I finally found a clue. Aisha was here. Ultimately, only the mercenary corp would answer to her every beck and call. Instructed them to spread rumors first thing in the morning, then took one of the routes mentioned, or perhaps a different one altogether. Sounds like one of Aisha's clever schemes. It won't end just here. Even if I follow the correct trail, more and more traps would certainly await me. I believe you. But in return, you too will help me search for Aisha. Is it a good idea to rely on the mercenary corp? Perhaps they'll just fake the search. Or corp itself would leak intel to Aisha. That possibility certainly exists. Relying on others and having it backfire, that kind of thing happens all the time. But right now I can leave no stone unturned. Despite my thoughts, Rinya and Persona looked rather troubled. Well, can I persuade you to give up Naya? The advisor warned us before to think very carefully about whose side we're on, when push comes to shove. If that gets exposed, it'll ruin our reputation. No one will ever respect us again Nano. Looks like Aisha had something on them. It's hard to find anyone in the corp willing to make an enemy out of Aisha Naya. She got something on everyone's Nano. So it's not just them. And all the mercenaries working here owe Aisha favors too. In other words, Aisha had the entire corp under wraps. I'm not trying to hurt Aisha. I just want to talk even so and I don't know what we'll be talking about. Don't you think it'll be terribly lonely if we never get to meet again? My words might not be particularly convincing, but my heart wrenches at the thought that we'll never see ours and Aisha again. At least exchange a few words. That's my true feeling. But right now if we cross paths, it'll just be a repeat of yesterday. I'm counting on you. 
Rinia turned toward Persona as she listened. Persona looked troubled still, but she finally nodded, her ears drooped. Rinia said after clearing her throat. I understand Naya. If the advisor really intends on running away, I think there's not much we can do to help, but at least we can give you a hand. Are you sure? When I became a slave, I also thought I would never get to see my family again Naya. I understand how you feel. Now that she mentioned it, that did happen. Hadn't her debt been repaid? I don't really know, since I left Aisha to take care of it. If there's any debt remaining, maybe I can get her repaid in merit. I owe you one. With that said, I made my leave. The mercenary corp may be mine, but for searching Aisha it's not the ideal. In times like this, I need to borrow the power of other organizations. First are the Magic University and the Magic Guild. They're the primary power brokers of Magic City Sharia. If Aisha's trying to misdirect me away from the city, they can be of help. As long as I put up a bulletin on the school boards, I might get intel from the student body. Right, I should go check in with Zainoba. Zainoba Company. Originally set up as a small storefront for the sole purpose of selling the Rujerd picture books. But due to the solid foundations built by Zainoba and Julie in the early days, its operations have expanded massively in recent years. Not only did it have major factories in Asura Kingdom, its branch stores have spread all over the world. Even though Zainoba Company frequently employs rude mercenary company for protection, Aisha doesn't frequent here. But I do. So I suspect the chance of Aisha showing up here is low. Anyways, I should check in with Zainoba, Julie, and Ginger. Inform the three of them, and one doll, what happened? Even though I would rather not discuss in public a family scandal. I think at least Zainoba should know. That was rather out of character for you, Shisho, do not make your reasons clear. After hearing my story, Zainoba said. It's not like I don't want to explain myself, just that ours two young still kids grow up fast. It's only a matter of years, a fact who matured early like Shisho is no doubt aware. Yeah. When Zainoba and I first met, we were not much older than ours. Well, there's a difference, if I count my previous life too. Perhaps it was because Shisho knew this, that Shisho used age to refute them. Everyone grows up. Maybe just not right away. So long as they reflect on their actions, then work hard to better themselves, they'll grow. With effort, just like I had. Even useless trash like me ended up being somewhat respectable. So I do believe no one is beyond help, personal growth is possible for everyone. So what should I have said? Well first off, you might have been too stubborn. If Shisho forcefully separates them without discretion, they have little option but to elope. But I thought that if this was to continue, ours would always stay utterly dependent on Aisha. What's so bad about that? Even in those conditions, he can still mature. It might just take a bit more time, indeed, no matter how dependent, no matter how slowly, he would eventually grow up. Maybe lacking in certain areas. But even then it's fine, as long as there's those around him willing to come to his aid. I certainly am well aware. So why was I so strongly against it? Julie, what do you think? Anyways, let's get a female's point of view. She looks downcast and pale. What's wrong, Julie? No well. Julie, do you know something? Don't tell me, you're hiding something from Zainoga Summer? Seeing that Julie refused to talk, Ginger who had remained silent until now spoke. I saw it. Saw what? This morning, I saw Aisha and Ars heading to the basement. What? That made me jump. A new clue. There are teleportation circles set up in the Zainoba Company basement. They connect to our secret laboratory in Asura Kingdom Fitoa region. Julie, why didn't you say something earlier? Because Zainoba Summer and Rudyu Summer have been sneaking in and out the basement too, A. Eh? Zainoba looks away. Maybe he thought we missed our chance to catch Aisha, because of what we have been working on in secret. But it's just like Aisha, to find a weakness to exploit. Alternatively, 
If we hadn't been sneaking about, she wouldn't have taken this escape route. You didn't notice, Zainoba? I stayed overnight at the store yesterday. Oh. Likely that Aisha knew of Zainoba's travel plans. Since there are probably corp members undercover among Zainoba Company's bodyguards. So they headed to the Asura Kingdom. In that case we're going to need Ariel's help to find Aisha and ours. Yeah, I'll do that. First I should visit with Ariel. Shisho. Zainoba stopped me as I was about to leave. Whether be with your siblings or kids, when you're at odds, make sure you sit down and talk it out. With the younger generation, you have to listen and consider their views. Even if you're right. You might think I'm speaking out of turn as a third party. No, thank you. It's rare for Zainoba to lecture me. Maybe he spoke out of regret for his brother Pax. I can appreciate the weight behind his words. He's right though. This time around, I never tried to hear what Ars has to say. Because he never spoke up, I just spoke to Aisha and ignored him. Never gave him a chance to explain what he wants to do. Never considered his opinions. Back then, if I had handled it better, maybe they wouldn't have eloped. If I could find them, I would listen to what Ars has to say. I'll do that. Aisha and Ars are presumed to be hiding in Asura Kingdom, the largest country in the world. Of course, it's also the most populated. Like hiding forest amongst the trees, no one keeps track of when new faces show up. More importantly, because it's a wealthy nation, eking out a living won't be a problem. Of course, Asura Kingdom is also a military society. There are soldiers stationed everywhere. If given portraits of Ars and Aisha, they should be able to find them. I'll try to get cooperation from the knighthood and army. I hurriedly rushed toward Ariel's residence. By the time I arrived, it was already evening. When I said it was an emergency, I was led directly to Ariel's sleeping quarters. That's it. Ariel was already in her pajamas, her hair a mess. She must be asleep already. All tense when I first arrived, as soon as I finished she could only wearily complain. What do you mean, that's it? It's just trouble at home. All ah, right, I was wondering what it could be, when I heard you had an emergency. Ariel is a busy monarch. Recently, it became impossible to meet her without prior scheduling. But I got an audience as soon as I asked. Being told of an emergency, she must have assumed it was Hitogami-related or teleportation circle-related. So agreed to meet me. In other words, she only allowed my audience because of the trust vested in me. But my issue is merely family troubles. A little inappropriate. You're right. My apologies. No need for apologies. An advisor for the rude mercenary company disappeared. A capable one. Her going missing will have an adverse impact on our future plans. It meant a lot for you to say that. Anyways, I'll have Sylvester assist with the search. But if she really doesn't want to be found, I'm afraid that won't be much help. Rapidly Ariel wrote a note and sent it off with a servant. Sylvester is in charge of security, one of the seven knights of Asura. I have seen him quite often recently, but only exchanged pleasantries. We never really had a chance to talk, so I don't really know much about him. I really appreciate it. In that case, I can just leave the Asura side to them. I need to figure out what I should do next. As I was about to make my leave, Ariel spoke out. I guess it runs in the family. The family? Running away due to family rules, hasn't your father done the same? Ah, Paul. Now that she mentions it, Paul became a runaway after a disagreement with his father. He never returned. I don't think they ever reconciled, either. Am I following their footsteps? Aisha, and ours too, are we never going to see each other again? Be honest with me, why are you so against it? Even if you ask just let them get married. Consider it a reward for Aisha, of all her royal years of service. You hear these kinds of stories in Asura all the time. The master rewards a capable servant with the hand of his daughter. Of course, with their mutual consent. Ariel once said, 
When the kids grow up, let one marry one of her daughters. It's not unreasonable. Truth is, there are many unhappy with me, for taking advantage of my role as Ariel's confidant and acting freely within the Asura kingdom. Stuck around for all the advantages, just because I was once an assistant to Ariel. I'm only installing teleportation circles within Asura for the associated privileges, some said. Basically, I'm just a clinger on who has long stayed beyond Ariel's welcome. That's why, if one of my children, particularly a son, ends up marrying into the royal family, it'll demonstrate to the public the depth of our friendship. That was Ariel's desire. Because it's Aisha and ours. That can't be right. One is the aunt, and the other is the troublesome nephew she helped raise. What's wrong with that relationship? Just because ours is the firstborn son? You're not nobility. He doesn't have to continue the family legacy, didn't you say that before? It's not that. Just that, marrying so close within the family is not good? What's wrong with that? What is wrong with that? Why do I find it so repulsive? That might have been forbidden in the previous world, but this world lacks such prohibition. For those families that find import in bloodlines, marriage between nephews and aunts are not uncommon. So why do I reject it? Is it jealousy? That I do in fact love Aisha, and had long considered her mine? No, impossible. If that's really the case, why would I refuse to make a move on her? No, it's something else altogether. Maybe it was as Aisha had said, that I consider her property? Even if I adamantly refuse, in my heart I already thought so, but instead projected that anger on ours? Not impossible but that doesn't feel right. Because it impedes ours growth? That's true, but that's a secondary issue at best. What made me so resistant is another altogether. I don't know. Then you should spend some time thinking it through. I'm sure Aisha would really want to hear it. Yes. Just like Ariel said. Before I talk with Aisha again, I need to get my thoughts in order. Or it would happen all over again. Before I get to convey my thoughts and feelings, Aisha will escape again. Then I'll take my leave. I'm sorry for intruding you in your sleeping quarters. It's fine. On my way out, I greeted Doga, who's standing guard by the door. Full of concern he said, I'll help you find your sister. Much appreciated. After returning from Ariel's, I headed to Ersted's office. It was already late at night. Way too late for house calls. But there are more people I require assistance from. Even though I wanted to continue my work tomorrow, for now I need to request leave. Ah, rude you summer, have you found Aisha and ours yet? Not yet. Is Ersted summer in? At his office. I greet Alec, nod at the secretary Felia, and head toward the office. Before I enter Ersted's office, I hesitated a bit. Is it appropriate for me to request an extended leave? Ersted never put any guidelines for me on requesting leaves. Normally, as long as I asked, he'll give me as many days of rest as I like. On the other hand, leaving work unattended for days due to family matters is certainly inappropriate. No, this is important to me. Just do it. Rude use. Ersted peers from across the room. Just a glance, but it felt like he observed me intensely. Looks like he already knew what I'm here for. It made me nervous and sweaty. I have something to ask. About ours and Aisha? So you heard? Roxy mentioned it. Roxy? She's also on the moves. Well, even though I went out on my own, Sylphie and Eris must have been busy too. I need to thank them when I get home. Aisha seems to have run away. Right, and ours too. I'm looking for them. If Aisha's serious, she'll be hard to find. So said everyone, but I have to look for them. May I take some time off? I said, resisting Ersted's terrifying sight. Like always, killing intent emanated from Ersted's eyes. I'll speak to Perugius about this. Huh? Why Perugius? For what purpose? He spent time monitoring the ground. Maybe he can find them. Oh, of course. I'm counting on you. Looks like Ersted will lend a hand too. 
You refuse to listen and deny them, there must be a reason. I couldn't explain it either. Ersted seemed surprised to hear that. Well, now I really gotta think about this though. After that, I requested assistance from my acquaintances around the world. Neelish, the Great Forest, Kingdom of the Dragon King, Magic Continent, Basharant Dukedom. I explained the situation to every organization that I have allied with. Cliff lectured me too. While a troubling situation, with three wives already, you really shouldn't be the one to balk. Be more considerate. Elinalyz was shocked that I didn't just approve of them. Norn was surprised by Aisha's actions. She was angry and said I acted appropriately. Rujerd stayed silent after hearing what happened. Only in the end did he say, I'll help with the search. Even though they all have various opinions, they all agreed to help with the search. For the demon continent, I'll have to depend on the Atof Imperial Guards. But Atof is missing and more has not yet returned. A headless mob that's going a bit too far, particularly since it was me that picked a fight with Atof in the first place, but without direction from above, I can't expect them to act in force. I wanted to find the missing person tracing machine Kishirika, but she's missing. I feel like she can track them down instantly if I find her, but that plan failed. Afterwards, I got everyone I knew in the hunt. Even Leo is helping, and Ru Jerd has left home to join the search. Perugius was less than enthused, but agreed to search from above. Ersted and Alec agreed to help in their spare time. But we came up empty. Even with the world's most talented trackers and headhunters, no one found a clue. It's like Aisha and Ars have disappeared from this world, not a trace remains. It's been a month since then. Lilia turned bedridden from shock. Lying in her bed, all she could say was, I'm so sorry, if I had taught her better this wouldn't have happened. She probably convinced herself that she carried responsibility that Aisha and Ars would elope. Even though her health has improved, she remained despondent, troubled. Once I overheard her weeping in her room, but when I checked in on her, Zenith was patting her head. Zenith slapped me once. When I had Lara translate for me, she said, she's just sad. Seems like she approves of ours and Aisha getting married. Even though I was sure she would be against it perhaps in Zenith's mind, the vision she saw was quite wonderful. Or perhaps she's just happy for them. Silphy has been depressed, if only I left them with another option she also picked up Aisha and Lilia's share of housework. She couldn't help with the search, but she took over all the housework like laundry, breakfast, etc. It's all thanks to her that we managed some semblance of normalcy in a family crisis like this. Eris hadn't said much. She just pouts as she clenches the wooden sword that Ars has left behind. As if with her mind made up, she started practicing her sword swing. Roxy said I'll go look for them and began packing. I had to rush to stop her. I felt like if Roxy disappears too at this moment, this family would just completely fall apart. Even so, she is still helping with the search via her own connections. The kids are all nervous. Lara looks unfazed, but even her mischiefs have lessened in recent days. Sieg hasn't talked much, even though he's usually quite the talker, but he doesn't speak up at home anymore. Lily used to prefer indoors, but now occasionally she would go to the gate, climb up beat, and look out the main road. Chris would say, what happened to Arzni and Aisha Ney? I want to see them again and start crying. Lucy is worried about them. She already graduated from Magic University and is currently attending Asura Royal Academy. She's boarding there. Even though she's plenty busy with her own stuff, she made sure to reach out to her old Magic University classmates for help. As time passed, I returned to work. Not that I gave up on the search. Aisha and Ars are both very important to us. But there is stuff that I can't leave unattended. As time spent searching declined, time spent thinking increased. When eating, while bathing, before sleep, after waking up. I was always thinking. Why did I reject them with no explanation? No matter what, it wasn't right for me to disregard their opinions. Disregarding their opinions, I refused to explain myself. That was certainly wrong. I shouldn't have done that, 
I should have known better. But the answer never came. A month passes, then another. Aisha and ours are nowhere to be found. Half a year after they disappeared, I met up with Nanahoshi. It was the first time we met after they disappeared. So that was what we talked about. When I brought up Aisha and ours, she just listened in silence. She didn't raise any concerns, simply listened. That day, we also talked about other stuff. Of the past life. The topic meandered aimlessly. About the takoyaki shop near Nanahoshi's home. A takoyaki shop that was always there, one that I visited many times since I was young. How we could really use some takoyaki and rice right now. Stuff like that. Suddenly, while reminiscing, I remembered. Something that happened over thirty years ago. Something I should have never forgotten. It was before I was born before my life in this world began. Or perhaps, the start of it all. It was my previous life. The day I passed away. I had brothers and sisters. Brother was married already. And had kids. Two of them. Both girls. They look different from Norn and Aisha, they're Japanese after all, but they share in their innocence. Brother's house and my house, that is, our parents, are close by, so they'll stay over often. Along with his wife and kids. I took advantage of that. Set up a hidden camera in the bath for my niece. In other words, I took wire shots. Not that I'm particularly interested in my niece. Just that it was convenient, that was the only reason I did it. Then that day arrived. The day my parents passed away. That day I also set up my camera. And my brother found out. That day, I felt my brother was still willing to have a talk with me. At least, I thought so. If it were my sister's or younger brother, they would certainly beat me up right away. But my brother was different. He might be ready to give up, but he was still willing to give me one last chance. Our parents are gone, I can't protect you any more. It's finally time for you to step out on your own. If there's something I can help with, just ask. At that moment, I probably would feel a little motivated to give life another shot. Because the fact is, he'll help however he can. Brother was that kind of man. Since after so long, he never gave up on me. Until he saw that photo. Then my brother snapped. Now that I thought about it, that was the first time anyone ever beat me. Not the sister that long gave up on me, nor the younger brother who threatened me with a stick. Seeing that photo, he paused for five seconds, then shouting nonsense as he beated me. Only natural. I now could understand. I would have done the same. In that situation, if I was in my brother's shoes, I would have beat Aisha without question. In other words, that was what happened. The me that day, was my brother back then. But not only Aisha was a girl, compared to me in my past life she was ever more diligently working, living, and responsible. So I didn't beat her. But I couldn't help but feel so repulsed by what happened between Aisha and ours, so I forcibly split them apart. I was emotional. Because of guilt toward my brother, I compulsively acted that way. Because my instinct convinced myself the same mistakes are being repeated. That must be why I rejected them. But Aisha's circumstances are different. Superficially similar, but completely different. The feelings between Aisha and ours are mutual. I was just taking voyeur shots. Given time, they would definitely form a healthy relationship. Even though ours is indeed a little young, and he was probably acting on instinct. But it had been ten years. For over a decade, Aisha was with ours. Ten years are a long, long time. Impeding ours personal growth was a mere excuse. It was purely my own overreaction. So I acted just like a brother. That day, my brother cut me off. After I died, our relationship was forever severed. But even if I had lived and wished to apologize, what could be done? Even if our relationship was over, I could at least apologize. He won't forgive me, and will never be the same. But there must be something I could have done. Even though I don't know what. All in all, at least I now know the source of my repulsion. That day carved in my heart a scar that never healed. 
so I always forbade myself from making another move on my family. Even if my scar and repulsion can't compare to my brother's. If I met Aisha again, I need to apologize. Apologize for wanting to force them apart without reason. If I don't, there's no room for discussion. Nothing would change. In that family meeting, Aisha had already apologized to me. Then she asked me for a reason she could accept. So now it's my turn. Apologize, and explain to her what happened in my past life. After that, I need to discuss with them about their future. Next time, I got to communicate better. I don't know how it'll turn out, but I don't want to force them to agree again. That was what I decided on. The search for them continues, since the day Aisha left that note, for over a year.